show where I try to educate real, real stories. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. I'm excited to talk about youth programs tonight with our guest, Mr. Stephen Holloway. Mr. Stephen Holloway runs the PACE Youth Programs Organization geared toward youth whose parents are incarcerated and juveniles who are involved with the juvenile uh, detention system, uh, juvenile justice system, and their parents. Um, I'm accompanied tonight by my co-host of late, Mr. Damien Walker. Damien is the person tonight who has gotten Mr. Holloway here to talk to us tonight about his nonprofit and the great work that he's doing in our community um, to let you know that there's things to do. So Mr. Holloway, talk to us. Tell us who you are and how you got started in this great, great endeavor. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, Ms. King. Um, I started this organization back in well, actually, I started in ministry back in uh, January, June of 1995, working with kids who uh, were incarcerated at the state school level in Crockett State, at Crockett State School. Fell in love with it. Uh, actually, it was my calling, and I answered the call and went to work. Um, and so I've been been in it now, going almost 25 years. Oh wow! And uh, the first six years was. Uh, working with those kids while they were currently, you know, incarcerated. And then when they were released, that's when I began to put uh, our program together because recidivism was so high back then. Um, and based on me building my relationship with them when they returned home, you know, because of that, that relationship, we it was easy for us to come together and, and start to, to uh, work together. But at the time, I just... All I could do was take them to church at that time. And um, I began to start putting these classes together. And I thought about my own life, uh, what I would have needed when I was a younger kid. And Talk I knew- Talk to us about that. Well- your, What was your experience to lead you to this calling, your personal experience? Yes, um, at the age of seven, I found myself sitting in a cold courtroom in downtown Houston, Texas with my mother and three younger sisters. Uh, my father entered in, handcuffed and shackled, and immediately I was, I was paralyzed. I couldn't you move. You saw it? I saw it. I, we, were sitting, I, we were sitting in the, in the courtroom when they brought him out. And uh, I could not move, I couldn't scream, I couldn't holler because, I guess back then I, I, I was in shock because my dad was a class valedictorian at Booger T. Washington High School one of the start, uh, starting wide receiver for the football team, and one of the first African-American supervisors for Southern Pacific Railroad. Wow. I could not understand what was going on. But even when you were seven, you didn't know he was all those great things. He was just dad, right? He was, no, I knew about him. Okay. Uh, my mother and my auntie were the captain and co-captain for the major, of the major Rets. All right, uh, now, uh, in that's why you handsome, had those pretty parents, <laughs> huh? So I, I knew what my my family, you know, was involved in, and, and we were close. I always saw my dad come home every day. I, I woke up with a mom and dad every day. And then when that happened, um, it happened so fast. He walked, you know, they took him out, and we went home. I don't remember the ride home, but I do remember when I did get home, I said, Mama, where's Daddy? She said, Baby, he's in the hospital. I said, The hospital? I said, Well, when is he coming home? She said, I don't know. I said, well, I'm gonna go outside and wait for him. And I sat at 3622 Wentworth in Third Ward, waiting for him to come home, and he did not come home that day. It was the most, it was devastating. And um, I found out that he had received a 13-year sentence um, to serve at uh, the Walls Unit in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. And back then, we really didn't, 
I didn't know what a jail was, a prison. We didn't really, because we grew up in a, a pretty decent neighborhood. And everybody that was either, that was a mom and a dad, or uncle and an auntie, grandmother, grand, we were in a community where everybody looked out and took care of us. We saw each other every day. Mm -hmm. And so when that happened, um, again, I was, I was devastated. I was the oldest, uh, the only son, the, the first great, great grandson. And I was just used to having my dad there. And all of a sudden he's no longer there. Uh, my grandmother picked us up sometime later, a couple of months or so, and took us to Huntsville. I still didn't know what was going on. We didn't talk about it. Cause now, which grandparent was This that? was his, his mom, who was a Wheatley Wildcat. And uh, she took us to see him. When we arrived in, at Sam Houston State uh, in uh, Huntsville, we passed Sam Houston State University. We went on another block or two, and there's this big place, this red brick, this, you know, uh, I see a lot of people. Uh, we end up parking, and it looked like a hospital to me. Um, still don't know what's going on, but we walk up point, those But you're, you're thinking that you're going back to the hospital? Ex ab absolutely. Okay. I'm thinking we're going to a hospital. Okay. And so when I go up those stairs, put my hand on that gold handle as a seven-year-old kid, and when I entered that prison at that time, immediately that was a different kind of smell I had never smelled before. There were sounds that I had never heard before. And we sat down at the um, visiting table, separated by a plexiglass. And then he walks around the corner a few minutes later and I lost complete control of my emotions. He was in all white and I just cried like a baby for the first two hours. I couldn't get control of myself. And so after that experience, um, I went home and I believe God had put on my heart that one day I would be working with people, with families just like mine. And- uh, So your, your grandmother or your mother never told you the truth? They never, never told, told you where you were going? Never told us the truth, never. Because back then they used to say, oh baby, you're gonna be okay. It'll be all right, don't worry. But you knew he wasn't in a hospital. They didn't try to fix that for you? No, they did not. No, they did not. And we, we really suffered in silence because he stayed there for five years. Oh, okay. And then he was released. And so... Did you ever know why he was there? Uh, I, I, I didn't know back then, but I know now it was because he had committed a crime. It was robbery. And uh, he did have a pistol. And why do you think pistol. he did that? Since he had well, a Well, you know, um, that was something that happened in our family. Um, my uncle was killed by my grandfather, shot with a gun for... So was it, did your grandfather kill his own son? Who was your No, no, no. He, he shot my uh, auntie's husband, self-defense. So he, taught, he, he shot his daughter's husband. Right, because of something that was going on, and my dad saw that. And now, I who, believe, now who was your dad related to in that group? The sister or the, the one that got killed? The, the sister. Okay. My, which was my mother. So it was his, his father. father. So it was your father's father. No, it was his my it was my mother's uh, grandfather. Grandfather. That ended up shooting my shooting, which would would later become what was my uncle's, my auntie's husband. We call him uncle. Yeah. Uh, and so he saw this, and never got any counseling. And I believe that's what. You know, by him not getting counseling to process through that, and he couldn't deal with it, he turned to drugs, and it was heroin. And heroin was pretty big back then. Right. And it just took him. And so uh, with all of that being said, it, it was just became a passion of mine that I, that I would be a developer of youth and that I would serve people who were, had gone through, uh, were going through the same things that we were going through. And so he was released after five years during the time when Fred Carrasco was in, he broke out. He asked my oh, dad to, to, to go with him, but he did not. That was like 1974. Yeah, exactly, because he went in. I was actually there. Is that right? I was actually there. I was a cheerleader in high school. I graduated from high school in 1976. I'm from San Antonio, and it was a cheerleading camp across the street at Sam Houston State. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a, at 
well, I guess it was Sam Houston, and mm -hmm. they, they had lockdown because of Carrasco. What was his name Carrasco? Fred Carrasco. Carrasco. It was trying. He was trying to break out. We were actually there across mm -hmm. the street practicing. You know, have y'all ever seen the NCA with all the cheerleaders? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of. I mean, it's, it was the summertime. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a summertime where you know you're younger than me, but I, you know I was a teenager. <laughs> Just so I was I was a teenager. Well, I'm 60. It was a ter I was a teenager, and so um, yeah, I remember when that happened. It was the craziest thing. That we're at cheerleading camp, and they're trying to do a breakout, mm. breakdown. So they had to lock everything down. We had to go in and stop the cheerleading camp for a minute. Mm. Yeah, it was it was a big deal. Yeah, that that was, and, and they uh, changed the way prisons operated at absolutely for a while. When he returned, he, he did see me play football at Johnson Junior High School, and I played wide receiver. And uh, it was a very, very exciting day for me to see my dad sitting in the stands. And within about eight, 16, 18 months or so, he ended up get, getting in trouble again, and he caught another case. And this time, he ended up receiving a 99-year sentence wow. for a nonviolent crime. And... Um, at 12 years old, I knew I would never see him again. Now I understand that he's in prison, he's done something wrong, and um, I, I, I really was, it was very painful. I went through a lot of different and negative emotions. Um, I thank God I did have grandparents. My grandfather took me. I, I stayed with them most of the, my life thereafter. Uh, he left. and. Um, he was, he became my God. And so when we would go see him this time, I understood what was happening. So what did y'all talk about when, when he was free? Well, when he was free, it was a very limited conversation mm -hmm. with my mother because that was still some, I guess, um, you know, after raising four kids by yourself, and she didn't really have a whole lot of help. She struggled. Mm -hmm. She suffered in silence as well. And um, we just didn't talk much. I did talk to him. Uh, when he did return home, I, I felt like I was seven years old all over again because mm -hmm. I hugged him and ju I just I didn't want to let him go. Uh, but before that, the first visit to uh, the prison where he was, which I found it was called Ramsey Unit 1. This is when he goes back. This is the second time when he go. We're riding down old Alameda Genoa Road. Um, I get to a certain area with those blinking lights, mm -hmm. and I begin to see rows and rows of cotton, rows and rows of vegetables, and I, I would seem to get a little nervous. Mm -hmm. And then when I got a little close to the lights, it had, uh, they used to have a big sign out front, a big red brick sign that says, Texas Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. When I saw that, I knew something was really, really wrong. Um, and then I would calm down a little bit until we got to the next set of lights. And it was Ramsey Unit 1. And it was a long, it seemed like a long ride from, uh, from the, 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 the highway to the first stop. It was just long. And when we got to that, to that, stop sign to the checkpoint. Um, they were very harsh. They were very tough on us. And I'll never forget the day we looked at the sign in, had his name on it, and it had TDC 287889. And I believe that was the day I became that same number because I suffered in silence and never, never talked about it to anybody. My family, we never did talk about it, which was, was I think, really was sad that we didn't. We should have been able to talk about it. We should have had counseling. We should have had more support, but we just didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And um, he spent 25 years at that, oh at Ramsey God. Unit 1. Mm -hmm. He did come home. Like I said, we were reconciled, and he died about a year later. So I never caught a football from him. I never went fishing. We never talked about, you know, dad and son type things. And... Um, now, why did how did he die? Uh, he had cancer. Uh, he he was a smoker, uh, but he um, he did pass from um, lung cancer. And um, I did he did get a chance to meet his granddaughters because I have five girls. Oh wow! Uh, and three of them are triplets. So I want yeah, God really blessed me. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> They'll be eighteen in a couple of couple of weeks. 
Um, I have, uh, and they were able to meet their grandfather, and uh, we did talk a little bit about it. And now they know fully what happened now, because uh, I've shared that story with them, and because I thought it was very important that they understood, you know, this is what happens when you get in trouble. Uh, this is what happened to a family when you don't talk about it, but this is what happens when you do. And uh, it has just, it's, um, it has been my fuel, my motivating, a motivating factor to keep me moving forward. Um, during that time, uh, because I didn't have the proper uh, support, I had a grandfather, don't get me wrong, he was a good guy, but I, I was still a knucklehead and wanted to do things the way I wanted to do, and I ended up uh, getting involved with drugs. Um, How old were you when you got involved with drugs? Uh, it was early on. Uh, I got deeper in the. It would have. I think I would have been somewhere around 13, 14. Started drinking, smoking mm -hmm. weed, and 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 uh, popping pills. But after um, high school, went off to the military, returned back, and it got even deeper. Did you talk to him about it? When, like when when he was released. So you are you were doing drugs, drinking, and everything. So now he's out after doing the 25 years. Did y'all talk about it then? Did you talk about your condition or how it affected, how everything that he did affected you and you were actually following that same path? Well, at the time when he was released, I, I, my drug addiction was over. Okay. I had turned my life over, got it, got a hold of me, and I, we, we talked a little bit about the experience, but one of the things he said to me, had I not gone, you might not be where you are today. And so I took that as though my dad was saying, I was proud of you, I'm, 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 you, you good. And we really didn't do a whole lot of more talking after that because then he got real ill and um, and then he, he, he passed. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't go into a lot of details, uh, but he did talk about how proud he was of, of what I was, was doing now in life and how my life had turned around. Now, did you visit him those whole 25 years? Uh, the first couple of years, I did. The first couple of years, um, I, I did go visit, but after a while, I started getting angry about going. Mm -hmm. I couldn't talk to nobody. Um, it really was frustrating, and so I stopped going. Uh, matter of fact, I stopped receiving cards. The communication was stopped, and so I, I just left it alone. And so um, when I graduated from high school, I went on off to Lamar University, played a little football, and then I went into the military, 84, which was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Probably should have went in a little earlier, but I, I loved uh, the military. It really did a lot for me. And How uh, long were you in the military? I was in the military for, I had three years active and three years inactive. Uh, got a chance to see the world, got my education, um, and did very well. Promoted uh, quite a bit within within the military and just had a had a fantastic um military career. What uh, what branch were you? I was in the Army. So did you go through my hometown, San Antonio? I did go. Matter of fact, San Antonio was my stomping ground. All right. When that's, I why returned. You, that's, that's why you like the Army, yeah, San Antonio. Yeah, when I returned home, uh -huh. it was called uh, the Bone Shakers, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah. I've heard, I've, I've heard of that. I've never been there. But <laughs> Grand Central Station, I believe. That was I've one of that too. My, my people stayed off of East. Um, East Houston? Yeah, it was East, uh, East Houston, uh, near Sam Houston. Uh, Crockett Street. Crockett that's Street. Oh was. yeah, where you were from, Crockett mm -hmm. Street, where you were uh, working, doing your work. Wow, that's a very, very interesting experience yeah. that you had. So uh, that wow, that really did equip you to deal with children of incarcerated parents. Yes, it did. I mean, 30 years of my life, I saw him go from black hair to white hair. You know, mostly all his teeth, all he know, it, teeth, and and it it was it it was just, it was very impactful because. Every boy wants to be with their dad. Yeah. I believe every daughter want to be with her mother. I mean, every, every kid want to be with their parents. Right. And to to not be able to flush out what was going on, what am I feeling, because something is different now. Right. I used to be so excited to see him come home, and my sisters, we 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 went to church together. I mean, that was about all we did, and then to our family members. Um, my grandparents stayed on the south side of town and we went third ward. Mm -hmm. And so that was big, going to either, either grandparents' house. They were on, my, my mom's grandparents were on the south side and his parents were on the north side. So between cousins and back then we just visit with our relatives and uh, we just spent a lot of time together. Wow. 
Wow, that's a lot. So tell me about how you guys know each other. Well, we started, um, we were selected to be a part of the Anthony Gray Smart Justice Speakers Bureau. Uh, went through that process, and the first day of class, uh, we, both, we both were awarded the Craig Washington um, Scholar. All right. So the, uh, Anthony Gray's Craig Washington Scholar, which is basically um, Senator, was it Senator Al Green? It was State Congressman, Congressman Al, Al Green. Green. Um, he sponsored it, but he, it's named after Craig Washington. Mm -hmm. He wanted to honor Craig Washington, and uh, we went through that process of, of learning how to work with policy, do speaking in front of um, congressional uh, meetings, and just a, a whole experience of going to Austin lobbying. Mm -hmm. um, and my good friend here, he was one of the standouts, and he was able to actually write a bill um, and there were 13 indicators for HISD, for, 13 indicators for the state of Texas for at-risk children. And Stephen wrote the 14th indicator. Why were we in class? Like, we went to class and nobody really knew what was going on. <laughs> and we just knew that we were here, we were getting this honor. And, I mean, he came out writing a bill and we went through the process. I sent you a picture where yeah. we were actually in Boys Myers' office, um, had my, my, my clean camel skin <laughs> <laughs> on, and the bill passed. Like Steven, I mean, Steve stayed down there uh, countless times. And I, I can tell the story. Um, he, he, he used his own money. He drove. Friends let him stay in Austin. And he was, whenever it opened, he was there. Whenever it closed, he left. He stayed down there for days at a time. And for the Anthony Graves uh, Speakers Bureau members, it made us proud because we went down there, but a few uh, of the members were actually totally, totally dedicated. Mm. And they fought for bills. And we were able to witness from beginning to end uh, what it takes to get a bill passed. Mm. And Stephen was able to get his bill passed. Um, the 14 indicators at risk children. So children of incarcerated parents. And they had been left out for so long as far as uh, at risk, because who knows how to deal with a child of an incarcerated parent? Like where, what, what does the training come in at? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what triggers are, are there to look at? And nobody actually knew those things. And Stephen had been working with it. He'd been through it um, for 30 years. And then on top of that, you know, himself, doing things himself. So I was able to witness that from beginning to end. So that's how we met and we've been rolling for about a year. <laughs> we've been rolling for about a year. So talk to me about that bill. That wow. sounds exciting. It, wow, it, talk about it that. Was, um, it was, it, it really was. Um, man, I just don't know where to begin because it was, uh, when Damien, when we, I, first of all, I was shocked that I received a, a scholarship for this program. Um, it just wiped, really, really wiped my, encouraged me though. And, and, but uh, about, Four or five weeks into the program, uh, I began to, I was like, Daniel, I was trying to figure out what in the world is going on here? What are we doing this for? But when we moved over to our professor's home office, the game changed. Who was that professor? That was Professor uh, San, uh, Walker. Uh, I can't, I, it's difficult to say. Well, I can't think. It's, um, it starts with an S. Um, I have it in my phone, but I'm going to pull my phone. Mm -hmm. okay. Dr. Professor Walker. Walker. Okay. Professor Walker. San, San, Sandifer. Sandifer Sandifer Walker. Sandifer Walker. Dynamic journalist. I mean, she, she was outstanding. And so she really started helping us get down into research. And, you know, statistic had always said that children of the incarcerated are six times more likely to be incarcerated because of their family or in, in criminal behavior. And I, I just couldn't, I never went to jail, never went to prison. So that got my attention. And we began to do the research, and I found out that the Texas Education Agency had 13 indicators, and this is what they, you know, kids who they consider at risk of dropping out of school was on this list. And so I did not see children experiencing parental incarceration on that list. We did a little more research, found out they created those in 1990. They wasn't there. We come back in 2010, they updated those, and they still wasn't there. And so I put a policy brief based on what I had been taught and I was putting it into action. And um, when we completed the program, I still had, I 
had it crystal clear. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but we kind of just kind of stopped for, you know, after graduation. But I went a little bit deeper and started praying, figured out what, what am I supposed to do with this? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I did a little research, went online. I thought that this would have been a corrections uh, issue. And so I went to the um, chairman of the board for corrections. And I just typed him and I said in my email about 3.30 on the 28th of December of 2018, Dear State Rep White, I am TD, TDC number 287889. I would like to share my solution to preventing intergener stopping intergenerational incarceration. May I have 30 minutes of your time? And I said, I'm willing to come drive to wherever you are. Two days later, I get an email, we get set up. I'm in this office on the 16th of January. State Rep. James White. Out of where? Out of, he's out of Jasper, out of that Jasper County area. But he's the chairman of the board for corrections. So I went uh, with uh, that, that day, I talked, told my story. Um, I asked him if, you know, we could set, you know, we need to, to make sure that we include these kids and when I looked up, everything was going the language. He said, yeah, well, we're going to do it. I said, okay. Wow. So a bill number returned on February 20th. House Bill 2116 was the original bill mm -hmm. that was going forward. And then I was advised that I needed a companion bill. Now, take, I don't have no political experience. Now. Right, right, right. I went to a 12-week class of learning how to tell my story and do some research, but I've never been into, at the Capitol. I've passed by it, <laughs> waved at it, <laughs> but never walked in. Mm. But the day I walked in, things changed, and I knew that I was, was going to be representing. Uh, we have 277,000 children in the state of Texas that are experiencing parental incarceration. And then I knew that I was representing all those people that empowered me and poured into me over my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so the bill re returned to us on the 20th. I found out how to create a, a companion bill to go alongside it. And what was that about? That companion bill, we had to have it on the Senate side. Mm -hmm. And so I went uh, to, we went to, matter of fact, Damon was the day I went, we went to Senator Boris Miles' office. Mm -hmm and talked to them and asked them if they would carry the bill on the Senate side. And they agreed. And so then we ended up the next month with Senate Bill 1746. And on May, May 10th, I believe it was, the bill passed. And I saw- Congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that board light up like Christmas. It was all green lights. When I looked up, that was 136 people had said yes. And, and what are they saying yes to? Exactly? They're saying yes, that we need to add this indicator okay. to the Texas Education Agency as number 14. And the governor signed off on it on June 2nd and made it effective on June 2nd. Mm -hmm. And so we got a bill passed that now our children who have parents in prison have an have an opportunity now uh, to get resources such as guidance and, and counseling and maybe some in in uh, in class support and then after school support. How did that how did that change what you were doing? Because you have been doing it for 20 plus years at this time, close to 25 years. So now you've been doing all this work. You go through a 12 week class. You write a bill the last eight weeks of the class. <laughs> You go through that process of getting everything done. So how did that change what you had been doing for 23, 24 years? Well, I had always wanted to work with children who had parents in prison. But, you know, God has a way of, of uh, taking you where he really wants you to be. So I went through Texas Youth Commission as a volunteer. And what I found out after several months there, that most of those kids that were incarcerated, parents were incarcerated at the same time. So I was right where I needed to be, and that's when I knew, you know, I'm, this is the, the population that I'm working with now. So I'm gonna provide a life skill and a support, life skills and a support system for that caregiver as well, and that parent. And so um, 
the intervention program what I've been doing since January 3rd of 2001 is providing kids who are on probation and in, on parole with life skills. With a set, with, we started off at 17 weeks providing such as skills such as um, uh, anger management, decision making, and effective communication. Now it's this is your this is your your the program that you have. Right. And what's the name of the program? It's called Pace Youth Programs. Okay. Pace stands for proper self-image. Kids need to know who they are. Uh, academics, and we provide some assistance in that area. Uh, C is for character, because most of us have character flaws, so we need some assistance in that area. And then E is for employment. Okay. And then we had, um, I used to have uh, what we call, I took the traditional name of mentor and changed it to coach. Because mm -hmm. when you hear coach, you think of a team. So I wanted this concept to come across. Not only are you going to have a comprehensive program, but you're going to have a coach to walk alongside you. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, this bill has moved from a local to now possibly to a statewide opportunity. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is instead of a 17-week or 12-week program, it's now a 12-month program that we provide uh, life skills for the kid as well as a support system for that caregiver. And um, we do, there'll be, uh, every quarter there's a different curriculum mm -hmm. that has 12 sessions in each one of them. We deal with interpersonal skills, character development, uh, leadership development, and then self-image. Okay. And, uh, and through those classes, I mean, you know, through those semesters, we do, do you know, break it up a little bit and do some things outside without, uh, you know, always having a class. We go do, have a little fun. Mm -hmm. We used to... Um, uh, take them deep sea fishing, or we might go a football game, basketball game. But what I want to do is, I, what the plan was to always try to get the best seats that they, you know, we get a suite. Mm -hmm. And the reason I wanted, wanted them to, to experience that was because rich people are not the only ones that can do this. If you work hard, you can do this too. And so um, that's what has, has been working. We've been working with Harris County since 2004, juvenile probation. So what do you do with juvenile probation? Probation, we uh, provide this 12-week life skills program for kids on probation. Um, we go out to the units, and we, we'll, we'll meet. Um, we're at, we've been at as many as six locations around town where we take a uh, youth instructor and a parent instructor, and when they come in, uh, they're referred through the county because of, of my long-standing relationship. And uh, when they come in, they sign in, we sit down, we have some dinner so we can have some family time together. After that, you know, 20, 30 minute time, then we break off into groups. And so we have a youth instructor. So you do it actually at the juvenile probation facility? Yes, uh, called the CUPS units. Okay. Those community uh, probation units. Mm -hmm. And we do it for 12 consecutive weeks. Um, we do usually Monday through Thursday and we'll do three sessions, three 12 week sessions at that location. And sometimes- and How do y'all measure the results? Well, um, the county has done a recidivism rate for us where it's the re-arrest rate. After they finish our program, uh, they have done a, re a recidivism chart on this. They found that about 83% of our population don't reoffend. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and so I've, uh, I wanted to make sure, you know, I see what goes on in, in those classes because I, I, I'm not one of those kind that just tell you to go do it. I like to be in there with them. And so um, it's not just how many graduate from the program, but we look at the same community with a different group of kids without pace. And then we include the parent as well. How many parents, you know, the more the, we find out the more the parents show up, mm -hmm. the less likely they are to reoffend. Right, right. And so that's uh, just a, one of the ways that they, they look at that for us. Wow. That's yeah. fabulous. Yeah. yeah. That's fabulous. And I'm impressed that you were able to become a vendor yeah. of juvenile probation. It has. Been, we've been there since. Uh, well, actually, what happened when Texas... Youth Commission, they, you know, they had a few little issues and they changed the Big dynamics. Issues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I reached out to the county and say, can you just send some kids to us? We're not concerned about money. We got our own funding. 
and uh, they watched us for about three years and we were really doing some good work and uh, we got invited to the table and we were able to start going into their units because we used to be at a um, outreach center in Acres Home. Okay. Well, I'm glad as your name key comes up, he's putting up the your website, paceyouth.org. Yes. Uh, so that if anybody's watching, they can you know, find out more about your program. Yes. Do you just deal with juveniles uh, in juvenile detention or, or do you have any funding to deal with just regular kids who are at risk? Well, yes, re yes and no. We have, um, I do an annual gala, a little fundraiser where we raise funds that we're able to do um, what we would like to do outside. Um, we have reached out to some foundations and, and some and word of mouth. Um, you know, it's always a, it's always some hard work for a nonprofit. Um, you know, it takes money. You can only stay in, at your house for 30 days and then you, you got to, you know, so we have to really work hard at raising money and, and getting word, of, you know, get the word out. Um, county has really been, been good to us on our intervention side, but as far as the prevention program, we've been reaching out to other um, funding issues. What type of prevention do you do? On the prevention side, like I say, we do uh, we do those same type of classes, uh, and we try to use some different strategies, some clear um, strategies that will help produce help produce you know some leaders out of the out of the group, um, those who want to you know go off to college, go into the military. Uh, most of this this group really is looking for some somebody to support support them and encourage them. And I found out if when they know that you've been through what they've gone through now, you tend to be able to, to develop that relationship a lot better and they trust what you're saying and what you're doing. And uh, we keep them accountable to what, what we teach. That's very good. Yeah. What's your, what can you share about this, knowing that you were a youthful offender? I think I expressed to you before, and I always express to other people that if you have an opportunity to be a part of um, any mentoring, any intervention, it it helps an undeveloped child mm -hmm. uh, because they actually don't know they're dealing with a lot of emotions. Excuse me, you're dealing with a lot of emotions. Um, you're around a bunch of other children that's dealing with emotions and somebody in that group is going to stand up and be like the leader. You, so you got 13 year olds raising 13 year olds. Yeah. So when you have a, a man in particular, not saying nothing against, you know, the women, but mm -hmm. if you have a man in particular among a bunch of rowdy, you know, young boys that can offer stability, it, it's a, it's a game changer. Yeah. Um, and it can actually not only just save a life, but it can put a, a, a young man on the on the route to becoming a to becoming a man, to becoming a, a tax paying citizen. Uh, I could put a young woman on that route to becoming um, a good mother, a college graduate, you know, having a successful career. So the things that you're doing, if they were in place when I uh, went through my situation, mm -hmm. I think that I would have had the opportunity to straighten up. And that's what a lot of people don't get. They don't get that opportunity. Yeah, and then also, if they know that you are really genuine oh, about that's, helping that's the world. them, yeah. and you show your care, and I mean your love and your care for them, uh, they will open up. Yeah. I mean, I've gone into schools and just told my story. Mm -hmm. I'm being real, I'm being relevant, mm -hmm. and somewhat relational, and... I did a presentation, I'm not gonna call it school, but I did a presentation at a school in mm -hmm. Fifth Ward. And uh, I just, I told the story. And I said, if you want some help and you want to talk about it some more, I'm gonna be standing over here. Mm -hmm. Or you can contact your teacher. And um, when it was all over, I had probably about five or six kids just started easing and making their way over towards me. And the other group, you know, they just got the other group and left and then we began to talk and we created a class out of it mm. because they were experiencing parental incarceration. Mm. But because I had told my story, they felt like, okay, well, he, he didn't been there, mm. maybe. And we started in October, we didn't, October of last year on the 23rd, we didn't finish until right before the start test. Mm. And what ended up happening is the, the classes started increasing and they would go back and tell, hey man, you need to come to, 
Yeah. Word of mouth was getting out, and, and this brother's real. He ain't said like that, but <laughs> <laughs> he said, but he's real. And, and, and I believe if you're real with him, you'll be able to, to, to reach him. Mm -hmm. That's true. And that's been very impactful. What point of your story do you think captures the kids and, and all the other audiences the most? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question because there's a lot of different parts to it. Um, I think from my, my drug addiction, mm -hmm. how I survived because it was very intense of what happened to me. Talk about your drug addiction. Uh, we have 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, tell, talk about that. We, yeah, we didn't talk about what that. What happened is I ended up on, I got involved with crack cocaine. Oh, I didn't know I that. I lost okay. a $40,000 job at 27 years old oh, right. with no degree. Uh, I had gone through two divorces. I'm married now for the third time, but I'm 22 years in. And, um, and I was beaten with a crowbar that cost me 12 stitches in my head. I should have died that night. And I was on the same street that my daddy was serving, was in a cell. Old Alameda Genoa Road on one end, it goes to Angleton, and the other end, it goes into town. Well, the statistic was really clear right there that I would have, had I got caught that night, I took 40 rocks from a guy I was going to smoke all of them that night and die because I was trying to commit suicide. But that was another plan. Why was it so tough for you? I mean, you'd been married twice, or you'd had love, you had children. Already, what was going I'm, on? What was going on inside of you that you could not be there for your children and your family? I missed having my dad with me. I could and never, never could get over. I it. could never get over it. Never got over it. Even though I had my grandfather, and then he died, mm -hmm. and then um, it, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't get. I felt like I was cut short. And couldn't find happiness. I just couldn't, and I found it in, in drugs. But you couldn't find it in your relationships and having your own children to love and, and, and I'm just asking, no, try but, to do the right thing for it to make up for what your dad didn't give No, because the cocaine took over then, mm -hmm. and it was a different, it just, it, it really experience. took me. But that night when I was beaten with that crowbar, it cost me. So you tried to take the 40 rocks from somebody, and that I did take, oh, I took, took it from them, okay. but they caught me. Oh, gotcha. And caught me on the Alameda Genoa Road. They beat me with a crowbar. I got hit twice across my head. I should have died that night. Mm -hmm. But They left you for dead? They left me for dead right there. But I had enough breath in my body to walk across the street. I, and there was this guy. I still believe he was an angel because he treated me like I was his own son. Oh, wow. It, and, and the Alameda Genoa Road lit up like Christmas in about five minutes. I mean, it just lit up. I knew they were going to get me. But, you know, they took the crack and... And so I survived that night. And, Who took the crack? Uh, the guys, they, when they hit me. Oh, they had taken it back. They had taken it back okay. and left me there in the middle of the street. My car was in the ditch. Thank God I didn't have the crack in the car. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I told the guy that, you know, somebody robbed me and blah, blah. And I was, wasn't being honest. Right, right, right. And, um, but to make a long story short, I survived that blow. And it's been 25 years now. And all I've ever done was tell my story and talk about how my life changed and that if you just stay focused on doing what's right and you do have, for me, I had to get involved with church because I said well, God what, had to know. I want to know about the angel though. <laughs> so the, the, the Almeida <laughs> lit up with uh, the police or with the ambulance? Am or, it was, but where was the angel at? Did he disappear? Did, I mean, you think the guy called the ambulance? Is that the no, angel? It, what did the angel do? What happened, he protected me. Because the rec all those record cards showed up and the police showed up. Mm -hmm. And he never called. I don't believe he called them. Uh, but he protected me. He gave me an opportunity to call my friend to come pick me up. And they took me to the VA to sew up my head that night because I'm a veteran. Mm -hmm. And I never did see that guy again. But So you let you use his phone? His phone okay. to make a phone call. And when I rubbed my hand behind my head, I could feel and see, you know, Something was really wrong. And uh, that was the night my life changed. And it has not, I love my, my family. Now it's a different ball game because now, you know, I know how important it is as a father in a child's life. And so uh, I've gone. Which child did you learn that with? Well, my first one, because I see, my first one, I thought she was going to be a crack baby. I really did because I felt like I was in 
I was really infected with cocaine in my system. Mm -hmm. She's a graduate from UT University, All right. uh, nursing school. She's traveling across the country. Um, mm -hmm. And she's 30 years old now. And um, I love I, I love them more now than I did when it all started. But I understand. But through your father's, for loving your children as a father, were you able to heal it all, reflect it all? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I know God in the Bible gives us instruction, but sometimes uh, experience does. Mm -hmm. Some counseling, were you ever able to get a little counseling uh, for yourself? Just or? a little, but I'm going to tell you where it really about two years ago. Uh, I went back, I was given an opportunity to go to Ramsey Unit 1 and speak to those inmates. And when I tell you, it, it, it did a lot for me. It brought a lot of closure for me because I also went the month before, I went to the Walls Unit, spoke to about 150 men, shared my story, talked about the effects that it had on me and what I was doing now. and. Um, it has just, it's been a phenomenal ride for me. And why do you think that added closure? Because you were at the place where you thought you, you lost your father? You know, like at the Walls Unit and as Ramsey. I mean, why would that experience give you closure versus having your own children to love to make up for? Well, you know, that, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a good question. I, um, because of the experience that I had gone through there. It was very harsh, uh, but now it was coming back where I was able to do something about it now. To you can incur. conquer, you can c conquer, encourage. Exactly. Conquer Those, your fields. You're in control of the situation now. Exactly. Because you weren't in tr control at 12 and, I mean, no. at, at 7 and at 12. No, not at all. And so it, it has, um, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, I was here way before then because I turned my life over, but that, going there to talk back with those guys because what used to happen is when we would finish talking, he would disappear. Right. And so I would never know where he was going. Right. And I think that's where the closure came for me. I was able to go back and see where he went and sat. Oh, behind the walls. Exactly. Yeah. Because exactly. you didn't know where he went. It was just a mystery. He was just a ghost just disappeared. Yep. And then now you knew what he was doing, how what his experience was like. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, that's deep, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, do you do so. anything for the children to understand where their parents are going when they go behind those walls, or is that something that child psychology tells us doesn't matter? I mean, do, well, you know, do they I, have to know? I, I think they do. I think um, we need to know, I th maybe not at an early age, because I know that is called an adverse childhood experience, but I think something needs to be said, or uh, probably from a, a, a psychiatrist. Um, but what I'm doing now is I'm going in prisons to talk to inmates about the effects of parental incarcerations on their kids, mm -hmm. and that they should never stop communicating with their kid, no matter what. Just even keep, if their kids stop communicating with them. Just, just even if they stop, you need to keep still, write, still Tell send a card, because they're gonna always know my daddy loved me. Right. Even though I don't write him or I don't see him as much, but I always get a note from him that say, hey, I'm proud of you. I love you. So you think that would have helped you? I think it would have helped me a lot. Because your father way. wasn't communicating with you. No. Why was that? Did he ever tell you why? Never told me. Never told me. I don't, I, I don't know why that took place. How did it affect your three sisters? Two of them have, they, uh, uh, they have been affected by it. Because uh, two actually have been to prison. Wow. And um, I thank God that they are safe and home now and doing well. Was it drug related also? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. So the six times more likely it did hit my family. You just didn't go to prison, but you were doing the, be you were doing the behavior. Yeah, and I, I, it, had I got caught, I would have probably got some real serious time. But I'm grateful that God let, let me be free. And I'm doing everything I can to try to help as many people, uh, especially our young folk. Uh, what about your mother? How did it affect her life? From what um, you see, I know you're looking at it. You were looking at it from a ch child's viewpoint. Yeah, she. What do you think? She she suffered a lot. Did raising she ever four, remarry? She did remarry. Um, she did go through a. a, a it didn't last long, but. Were y'all little kids, or had you grown up? We had grown up just a little. We were in high school. 
when when uh, our stepdad came through, and it, it lasted a couple of years. But and then after that, she just dedicated her life to us, trying to make sure that we were okay. And uh, she's 76 now. Oh, good. She's still with us. Yeah, I was scared to ask. Her. She's still That's with good. us. That's good. I was born on her birthday. All righty now. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. 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 Is she in a good place? She's in a good place. She's proud. Um, she did have a stroke a couple of years back, but she's recovered well. And um, I talk to her almost every day, just checking in. And uh, she's retire a retired school teacher. It was and, good she was able to work all those oh, years yeah. with the four kids. Yeah, graduated from Prairie View and Texas Southern and master's in counseling and education. And uh, taught elementary for almost 30 years. Good. Yeah. So what about your education? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, it was, um, I did finish in 2006, finally, after about 10 years of trying to get a, a degree in my associate in biblical studies. Um, they found, I, I attend the College of Biblical Studies. They found out what I was doing. Uh, they gave me a full four-year scholarship to come back to school, and I graduated with my bachelor's in organizational leadership the day after the bill was passed, mm -hmm. which was on May 11th of uh, 2019. Good. Yeah, so thinking about working on the masters, but yeah. uh, got a lot of work to do before I get there. Let's go. Right, so how do you encourage kids to finish school? Because I, I hear from parents sometimes that, you know, good parents that say, you know, I just can't make my child go to school. What are you going to do, beat them? You can't make them go to school when they get to you about 16, 17. Yeah. So what do you do about that? Well, just just keep encouraging. Um, Tell them the, the the importance of getting an education. It can always it'll it'll help you get a career. Um, it can help but you. But when you're 16, do you care about a um, career? No. Okay, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. I mean, so how no. do you do it? People ask me all the time because yeah. I deal in the criminal arena, but I don't know how to encourage people. I think there has to be some self motivation, but I I don't really know how. To, yeah, how to you just gotta people. just keep your hands on the plow and keep asking and keep encouraging and letting them know the benefits of it. And one of the things I say, hey, if you if you want to sell drugs, why don't you go to Texas Southern and enroll in their pharmacy school, and you get paid for it, mm -hmm. and you can sleep well at night, mm -hmm. or you know, instead of going to flip hamburgers at McDonald's, which is okay if you want, why don't you go learn how to own McDonald's, go into entrepreneurship, and because a lot of kids have a lot of skills, they just need to be encouraged and pushed, and sometimes a little extra in order for them to, to be productive citizens in society. Yeah, especially nowadays. So what's the difference between a 15-year-old way back when you started and a 15-year-old now? That's a good question. 15-year-olds um, back then, we had a lot of respect for our parents. People could say one or two, one, maybe one, two times, maybe two times, and you would, you, would, you would do it. But now you, you, you know, um, you got to say it a couple of times. I think it's about six, seven times before you, <laughs> you know, it's just a, it's just different now because back then we had a lot of men around, a lot of people, like the community was really engaged. Almost, um, I can almost call every person that I grew up, every parent or, or God, uh, grandparent or, or dad that grew up in my neighborhood, they could whoop us. If they saw something, they would get on us, but that's not happening today. I think they're scared to come outside because of what might happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we 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 uh, we just have to really stay after our kids. I think engaging them in school um, is a good strategy. You know, we need to have more men walking around school campuses now. Uh, we didn't have them back then. They used to have those. We used to have a pop. When they took paddling out, I believe that's when everything started going left. Me too. Left. Me too. Because you know. You could keep kids under control with fear. You Absolutely. just have to do that with fear because now we're scared of them. Yeah. I mean, they're going to bring guns and kill you. I mean, a kid would never think about that because you're too no. scared of that paddle. Yeah, I know. I got but popped I, too many times. Yeah. I stayed getting popped. So yeah. I stayed getting scared. popped? Yeah, yeah. You weren't scared of getting popped? I, I don't know why. I you just, just a <laughs> you're a little roughneck. You're just a toughie. But you didn't think about getting a gun and go take it to blow up the school? No, not at all. I was scared, man. Not at all. You know, and, we, and then we didn't But who'd do, want to do that? Who'd want to kill up all their friends? I, I mean, who'd want to do that? Even if you hate them, you, want, and, you don't want you to know, kill them. You know, and back then we used to want to go to school. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah you almost yeah. felt like you were going to miss something if you didn't go to school. So perfect attendance was, you know, I was... I was one of them perfect attendance guys. I always wanted to be at school, man. Yeah. Cause something, and then when I got in junior high and high school, even more so because, you know, the guys that I, I played ball with, we really were really good 
good friends. To, we're still good friends today. Oh, good. Uh, some of our parents, you know, we knew each other, and, and they just looked out for one another. A lot different than Very what good. we do today. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So tell us, um, now with your contracts with the juvenile probation, are they annual contracts? Is it long term? How do you, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, the contracts are annually. Um, we have to re, you, you have to reapply and you got to go through the process and uh, what, what's working. You don't need Because I know there's a new juvenile director, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Yes. And I've known uh, him for years, great, great leader, doing a great job with Harris County uh, probation, and uh, I'm glad to be a vendor with them. Okay. Well, you know what we're doing with the DA's office. We've committed to $200,000 to pay for the staff, uh, for the kids in 77020, which right. would be Wheatley High School, and was it McReynolds and Fleming uh, Middle School? Right. I think so. And DEAP is over there, too, I believe. So when they get in trouble, instead of going to the juvenile detention center, they'll go deal with the caseworkers. Yep. Uh, at Fifth Ward Redevelopment. We're really excited about seeing how that program works. Yeah, that, and we want to take it all over. We, 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 we got to see how it works yeah. out and hopefully Kim gets reelected. But we're going to work with that because we, we, from our study, we realized that 5,000 of the 11,000 kids that were being incarcerated every year were school related. Wow. 11,000 kids a year, 5,000 were school related. Wow. So why can't we go back to the old days of handling at school? Mm -hmm. So this is our transition to try to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's hard when you have all of these police officers at school. We didn't grow with police officers exactly. at school. But no. when you have police officers, and what do policemen do? They do their job. They arrest people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's hard to have them there and not arrest. So we can just have them take them somewhere else and not to the jail. And mm -hmm. I just don't like kids having handcuffs put on them. Yeah. That's just me. Uh, that, that puts you in a whole, I'm a criminal mindset. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I get used to it. I, I just don't like that. And you do get used to it fast. Anything that you do as a child, um, that's kind of outside of what the norm is, you get used to it really fast and you become fearless. And I think that's what happens. I, I, I've never thought of it like that, but, but just to hear it, um, you, you actually become used to it. Like you Yeah, say. you know how it's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know how to take that ride. Yeah. Yeah, so that doesn't, that doesn't deter you from doing wrong. It happened to me when I went to a juvenile the first time. I won't tell the whole story, but I, got a, I had a high-speed chase. Uh, so terrible, terrible experience, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, when I went back the second time for the crime that I was eventually certified for, the same officers were there. And uh, they remembered me because it, it was just months earlier. They remembered me. And uh, they said, and I told them the first, I said, I'm never coming back. And, and they were like, you back right now. And I said, I'm leaving again. I never left that second time, of course. But that's the mind frame. So you, you become not only fearless, but you become accepting of the situation. But we're being told to wrap up now. This was a very fun one hour talking about what we can do for youth and the terrible effects of parents being incarcerated. Hopefully some parents have, will watch this. Hopefully it will deter them or at least know that there are places you can go, counseling you can get uh, because there are people like you to help you deal with it. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King and I hope this was enlightening, as enlightening to you as it has been to me. Good night. Thank you for tuning in again tonight. We have something really good, hot topic in the news this week. This is a show where I try to